what is the one instrument that you think has influenced life sciences and medicine the most in last 300 years? If you ask me, the answer is the microscope. It is the microscope which told us that all the living things are made up of cells. And if you want to understand how living things work, you need to know how cells work. And how do you know how something works? The best way to understand how something works is to take a picture of that thing in action. Now, our eyes are like a camera, but we cannot see tiny objects like cells, which are, whose size is about one-tenth of the thickness of a human hair. For that, we need a microscope to see all these different objects. So how do different cells look like? Here are some examples. The red blood cells look like donuts. The neurons have tentacles that form networks in our brains. The plant cells are seen to be standing neatly in rows like soldiers. And if you look at skin tissue in thickness or in cross-section, you see many different types of cells in different layers. But now if microscope was not there, you will not be able to form mental pictures like this. How does a microscope look like? The simplest form of microscope is a magnifying glass. The magnifying glass allows us to read fine print, but it cannot see cells that are really tiny. The first compound microscope that was invented in 17th century looked something like that. A modern version of it, which is a clinical microscope, looks something like this. So if you walk into a pathologist's clinic, then you will find that this is the instrument that is used to look at blood or urine samples. If you happen to go to an advanced bioscience research laboratory, then the microscope there may look something like this. It is a very complicated instrument. It has battery of lasers, cameras, it has temperature controllers, and lots of things. But the goal of all this development is mainly to allow us to see cells in more and more details and see their machinery. Today I'm going to talk about a new kind of microscope that was invented in my laboratory at IIT Dil. What is the speciality of this microscope? The speciality of this microscope is that it allows us to see cells in a high-resolution holographic 3D mode. What is the use of that? Let us see an example of observing blood cells using this microscope. So these are pictures of unstained blood cells as they will appear in a typical microscope in a pathology clinic today. So the first cell here is taken from a healthy athletic person. The second cell is taken from a smoker individual. And the third cell has been taken from a malaria-infected person. Now, if you look at these images carefully, you see that the changes in them are actually minute. So it is very hard to distinguish these three different kinds of cells. But if you look at these cells under the new microscope, what you will see are these 3D pictures like that. The coding from blue to red in these pictures indicates the height of the cells. Now, all the three cells here look like donuts, but their changes, the changes in them, are highlighted significantly now that you have the 3D information. Now, here is another example of usage of this microscope for early diagnosis of cervical cancer that we are working on along with doctors. Cervical cancer is a challenge for developing countries like India, and it has already caused a large number of deaths among women. Cervical cancer is a curious case because it has a long latency period of several years. And so, if you have affordable and sensitive technologies that can be used on large scale, the high mortality rates in cervical cancer can be prevented. So let us look at how doctors see cervical cells under microscope today. These are some of the 2D images of cervical cells. The first cell is labeled as a normal cell, and the second cell is labeled as a precancerous nucleus. Now, you and I, with no clinical background, may find it difficult to distinguish between these type of cells. But if you look at them with the 3D microscope, the 3D structural differences that you can see are stunning. So what we hope is that if doctors start using this microscope 
for diagnosing cancer, their job may become a lot easier. And if you can reduce the rate of error in early diagnosis of cancer, the benefits to society in terms of economic benefits as well as human benefits are tremendous. Now, how do we see 3D in this microscope? You know, if you go to a 3D movie, you generally use glasses. So do we use some kind of glasses here? The answer is no. In fact, if you come to my lab and see some cells using this new microscope, what you will see is something funny looking like this. There are cells in the picture, but on top of the cells are some straight lines. So what is this? This is because this microscope can be considered as what I call as a computational microscope. In a computational microscope, you record images in a coded manner. And in such a way that maybe that what is recorded is not directly meaningful to you visually. But the coding is done in such a way that the coded image actually contains the 3D information that you are looking for, which is not possible to record with typical ordinary microscopes. Now, if you zoom onto one of the cells here, what you see is that the straight lines actually bend a little bit when they approach a cell. And this bending of these lines actually contains information, that is the 3D information that we are looking for. So if you can take this coded image and put it in a mathematical algorithm that we have designed, then you can get a 3D high resolution view of the cell as shown here. Now, the computational microscopes are interesting because they put equal emphasis on optics design as well as algorithms associated with them to decode this coded data. But what you can do is that by mixing the two, the optics hardware and algorithms, you can achieve something that, not, that is not achievable by optics alone and not achievable by algorithms alone. They have to work in some kind of a team to get this kind of new information. A computational microscope can also potentially cost much less because now the burden of providing the 3D view is on the algorithm and not on the optics hardware. So in general, there are a lot of advantages of this kind of systems. Now, it is great for me to say today that uh, we have invented this new kind of system. It allows us to see cells in 3D, and it can be used for diagnosis, and it is low cost and all that. But how does one get started with this kind of innovation? The word innovation is getting repeatedly used around campuses of technology and management schools. And so some discussion is required. Now, if you ask any innovation guru, he or she will tell you that in order to do some innovation, you have to start by identifying some problem faced by the society, then look at all the technologies around it that can potentially address this problem, select a right mix of technologies that are affordable, and try to put together a device which can then be applied to solve some problem. But I have a little bit different views on this. In fact, if you look at how we developed this microscope, this is not the path that we followed. We followed something which was completely different. In fact, as a new faculty in physics at IIT Delhi, starting about eight years ago, I was not really thinking about pathologists or how they work or how they diagnose cells. What I was thinking about was something completely different. So this whole thing actually started with some curious question that we started to probe that was right out of our class. The question can be put into a simple language like this. That let us take a laser pointer and shine it through a glass plate. The question we can ask is, does the light that has passed through the glass plate actually knows that it has passed through a glass plate or it has just passed through thin air? Now the glass plate is transparent and that makes answering this question very tricky because if you put a camera on the other side, what you will see is that in both the cases, about the same signal will be recorded by the camera. So how do you tell the difference? Well, what we know is that light slows down a little bit when it passes through the glass and the slowing down of light is imprinted on the light waves and uh, by a property that is known as phase of light waves. So if you can measure phase of light waves accurately, or in particular, measure the change in phase of light waves accurately, you can start answering this very simple sounding questions. They are not so simple to answer, they are easy to pose. Okay? Uh, now, what we are interested to image or not is not actually a glass plate, but really tiny transparent cells. 
And so the slowing of light in those cells is really, really very, very small. And, but the instrument, that is the microscope, is exactly trying to measure that very accurately to give you the 3D view of the cells. Now, physicists have known for a long time that if you want to measure phase of light waves, you have to use a phenomenon called as interference of light. What is interference? You have to do this kind of path. So, we have to take the laser beam, split it in two parts. One of the parts actually goes to the cells, and the second part, which acts like a reference, goes through air. Now, this diagram is a little bit exaggerated, but what happens is that when both these light beams fall on top of the camera at the same time, what you observe is the picture with lines that I showed you before. So if you have this kind of image, it contains the phase information that we are looking for, and using the phase information, we can generate the 3D view. Now, interference happens to be really an elementary topic in optics. However, when I started teaching interference in my class at IIT Delhi, what I realized was that if you wanted to get the full resolution 3D information, the number of measurements that you required to make were actually four to five times the number of pixels in the 3D image. Now, this made all the systems that measured phase very, very complicated. And so, they were very expensive to be used in a place like clinic. So this seemed a little bit absurd to us, and so we took up this problem for our research. After a while, what we found is that we could develop a new kind of mathematical framework to answer this question, and the result was that we could get the same high-resolution information with just about 20 to 25 percent measurements than what was considered required to solve this problem. Now, since we are measuring only 20 percent of the measurements, or we are taking only 20% of the data to get the same high-resolution information, what it means is that the cost of putting the, the system together has reduced drastically. But remember that the cost reduction here is not because we are using some cheap components or cheap labor, but because the new mathematics we came up with is actually much superior to whatever existed before for solving this problem. From an application point of view, what it means is that an advanced high-end technology like phase microscopy, which was considered very, very expensive, suddenly becomes accessible to a large number of users. Now, we don't know what is, the, what is going to be the commercial success of this device, but at least what we know for sure is that we, have, we are really backed by some real strong science that we have done in our lab. I would like to conclude this talk with two takeaways. First is about innovations. So I think that innovations are possible if we, want, if we can re-examine or probe the conceptual ideas that come into our daily work, meaning it does involve out-of-the-box thinking, but you don't have to go out of the way to do that. And the second thing is about the cost of building high-end technology. Well, with this microscope and some other projects in my lab, what I want to show is that uh, we can build high-end technology at low cost, but all you have to uh, do, so we can build high-end technology at low cost, all you have to make sure is that your science is better. Thank you very much.